gorgeous flasher rats. A lot of them are classics. I'll use this as an example. I just started this double daylight cycle experiment. <laughs> Hey, what's up, refers? Now that the 135 gallon tank is under control, things are back on track. It's time to add some more livestock to this tank, namely corals and fish. Let's take a look at the fish first, and then we'll take a look and see what's in this box. Flashback. <laughs> All right, guys, you see that Leon is super, super excited because today we have a new addition for the 135 gallon tank. As you know, I've been trying to raise my nitrophosphate. One of the best way is to add fish because as I feed more, fish poop more. And uh, today we are adding a absolutely gorgeous flasher wrasse that I got from Ocean Garden Reef. He is a local vendor. So we're gonna go ahead, acclimate this guy, do a safety stop on him, and then we're gonna release him into the 145 gallon tank. Besides the flasher wrasse, I also picked up a green Ganipora to add to my Ganipora garden. Uh, really, really strange situation. I know I have one uh, Super Tonga Nasaria snails. I don't know, I have two. I'm trying to think long and hard where this came from because I know I only have one. I don't know, I mean, I've always liked these guys, so it doesn't bother me, that's cool. Two hours later. Oh. Just as I'm putting away the uh, camera, he is definitely pretty small compared to his tank mates, which is the way I like it. I like small fish and I cannot lie. Um, I'm gonna feed the tank a little bit more. Yeah, so my biggest worry are these um, light tail amphias simply because their coloration is pretty similar. Same thing with the, uh, the body shape. Looks like a yellow tank. Oh, look at that. Yellow tank is actually chasing him a little bit, but not too aggressively, I hope. I know yellow tank could be a jerk. All right, well, I'm gonna let them do the things and I guess we'll check back later. I'm gonna turn the light off because right now it's not supposed to be light out. But before that, just for good measure, let me feed some of the uh, prime reef as well. Just to make sure everybody is happy with the full stomach. All right, guys, it has been about four hours. Uh, let's take a look. And look at the flasher rats right here. You see them? They're just kind of chilling in that little rock. And I can see his little eye kind of like turning and just tracking people. This little guy is really aware. Can you guys actually see him? The next day. Look at this hot mess right here. This is what happens when you have a kid, right? <laughs> Last night and this morning, I was freaking out because I could not find the flash arrest anywhere. And I was, I was like, oh man, I was disgruntled. And I was especially worried because I saw the pistol shrimp coming in and out constructing the tunnel. And as you recall, the flash of Raz was hanging out in a hole right there. So it was really close. I was afraid that the pistol shrimp may have like uh, nailed it or whatnot. But thankfully, right now I just saw that he's right here. Look at the little head right there peeking out. These days I've been using Benepests to try it out since a lot of people seem to be raving about it. That's what's hot right now. And uh, you know me. I'm one of those guys that follow trend. I have no personality. Sort of kidding and sort of not because I feel like certain products get popular because they have to work fundamentally. Otherwise, people won't talk positively about it. Hey, look, the fish is out. Dude is out. That worked. Hold on a second. Let's see. So, he definitely smells something. I know it's a he because of all the uh, little dangly bits on his uh, fin. Ay, okay, maybe that's why he's hiding. Jeez. You saw that uh, male light tail amphius? That was aggressive, dude. That light tail amphius was treating that ras like one of um, his females. Jeez. Man, that sucks to see because I know the flash of ras is relatively peaceful as well. But I didn't consider the light tail to be that aggressive. Especially towards another fish that is not an amphius. Granted, they look kind of similar in body shape and color. Man, actually, you know what? The male amphius is just out for blood today. He is extra mean. Does he feel threatened by the ras or something like that? Because the ras is better looking? All right, we're gonna give them a couple days to see if things work out. If things really don't work out, I'll just trap that fish could be kind of easy because it seems like he hides in rock and these are all small rocks here and just like pick the whole rock and that's it. Hopefully that's that simple, but hopefully they'll work things out. But yeah, if not, I'll try to rehome him. Not gonna be fun, but it's doable. Oh my God, I didn't know this guy's gonna be so aggressive towards non amphias that's insane. You chill out, dude, my God. Uh, this guy just kept playing like merry-go-around now. <laughs> Amazing. One week later. Welcome back, guys. A little bit of good news. The rest, instead of always hiding in that little crevices, 
Now it at least is kind of swimming out right here in this area. Not quite swimming with all the rest of the fish yet, but I think we're gonna get there. Right now it's still Wednesday, middle of the week. Every single day he gets a little bit bolder and other fish is a little bit more accepting towards him. Hopefully by this Saturday where I finish filming this video, we have some more footage to show you where he kind of like uh, venture out a little bit more into this tank. We'll see later on in this video. Since we've addressed the fish portion, we're gonna talk about corals and what's in this box. Like I mentioned in the past, I'm a huge fan of buying corals from other hobbyists, whether it's just from the reef clubs or swaps, whether it's big swap or small swaps, usually I find that actually the local swap have the best deals. Due to COVID, a lot of swaps got canceled. They're slowly starting to spin back up but until then, we pretty much buy from the fish store, online store, as well as local hobbyists. And in this particular case, I was able to link up with a WAMS member and bought quite a few Zoas. He has a bunch of beautiful Zoas at really good price. Most of the frag is about $15 to $20. Fantastic. Here are the Zoas, a lot of them are classics. For example, we got like Other Chaos, Eagle Eyes, Fruit Loop, and certain ones that I really like, for example, the Other Chaos and Eagle Eyes, I have doubles off. This way I can kind of like jumpstart the Zoa Garden a little bit. One really interesting thing with this batch of um, Zoas is that there are a bunch of these little fan worms that kind of came off. And they're just kind of wiggling a little bit. It's interesting because like usually fan worms, they get like a hard tube, but these guys do not. Once again, thank you for all the people who are leaving comments and helping IDing these uh, little hitchhikers. Looks like the uh, beneficiary tank. So I'll go ahead and probably add half of these in the 145 gallon tanks for Fujium. And then I'll add the other half to the mangrove tank. The next morning. All right guys, now is the all right guys, now it's the following morning and as you can see all the fish are kind of waiting here for food. Usually when I come down to this tank, I feed the tank over here. These are the beautiful zoas that I picked up from Nate from Wamas. Thank you once again. We got other chaos and then we got another smaller frag of other chaos here. And right behind it is rainbow infusion. And that's actually a zoa that I have already back here. But because I like it so much, <clears throat> when I saw that um, Nate is selling a, another frag of the rainbow infusion for like, I think it's like 20 bucks. I just went ahead and picked that up. To the left, we got the good old fruit loop. And Right behind that is uh, actually a freebie. I think it's, uh, it's Armor of God or something like that. I may have something similar in the back, uh, but again, free Zoas can be that. And to cap it all off, we got some good old eagle eyes in the back. And these actually looks really nice. Uh, it's almost like the watermelon. And along with these guys, I also want to mount the existing frags that I kind of just laid on the sand bed, did not deal with because of the dino flagellar issue. Uh, now that dino has passed, it's time to really organize the tank. Of course, we got this whole chunk of um, Rasta to deal with. And we got the rainbow infusion. We got, I think that's salty agave from uh, uh, Bahama Lamas, Remy. In the last month, so it has really gotten large and then you can see all the fine details absolutely beautiful coming over here we got this really really expensive pal leaf it's called the angus of uh, athena that came from joker's coral over in new york honestly i've not really paid it much attention due to all the things that was happening in the tank uh, but now that i can actually slow down and look at it dude this is this this pal is gorgeous but uh it has a hefty price tag and i'm just kind of looking at where i want to put all the things and i really want to shave back the uh grandis pally right here but at the same time, I really don't want to touch it because of the paddy toxin amounts. These guys are pretty toxic. At some point, I think I will probably get most of these, if not all of these, off this rock. I'm okay with them isolated on one rock, but not so okay when they're kind of like fighting for spots with the other pally. And I feel like the grandes really kind of destroy the uh, sense of scale because everything here is really small except for those guys. So it makes everything kind of look, uh, I don't know. Unfortunately on the same rock, we also got some really beautiful uh, zoas and pallies right here and also jawbreaker mushrooms. So it's not like I can just throw this whole rock away. So in the past, when I'm trying to build like a really integral uh, zoa garden, I'm a big fan of uh, cutting the zoas or even shaving the zoas off from the plug and gluing them directly onto wherever whichever rock I want them to stick on so that it looks flat it doesn't look like there's a bump there right this time around um, because in the past uh, it was a pain to kind of frag Zoa in that kind of uh, fashion I think if these uh, frag plug is really small like these guys I might just cut off the stem of the frag plug and just super glue them on the rock but that even though it may look a little bit awkward initially right once it's growing in it should be okay the benefit is that down the road when it has a nice colony going I want to propagate the Zoa and go in kind of twist and remove the frag plug and start another colony somewhere else or sell or trade that frag plug um, for uh, 
uh, other zoocytes do not have. One thing I get asked often is how do I control the Xenia in the mangrove tank on this tank because uh, they have a tendency to take over, right? But one thing I noticed is that Xenia is actually pretty easy to remove from like relatively flat rock surface. I'll use this as an example. We got a Gagonian. Uh, on a frag plug and the Xenia is kind of growing on the plug as well spread onto here. Uh, what I like to use is just a tweezer and just grab the trunk of the Xenia as low as possible and try to peel. And typically what's going to happen is that the whole thing should get peeled cleanly off as you can see there's no tissue left on the uh, frag plug. Of course you want to be extra safe, uh, you can go in with a razor and just shave off a little bit of rock. You gotta look at the Xenia and just kind of peel along the way, not just randomly like rip. Because rip you may leave some tissue and it's gonna sprout again. And of course right here this is much easier for me to show you guys because it's on a frag plug, I can remove the whole thing. But same deal on rocks, I find success in terms of using a strong tweezer with a good grip. Go in there, get as close as possible where the Xenia meets the rock and just hold on to it and just kind of rip up along the way. And usually you, it kind of cleanly comes off. Where you run into trouble is that you don't rip the whole thing, there's a little tissue left and it's kind of grow back. So unless you have a huge scale of infestation with Xenia, typically they are relatively easy for me to just kind of pluck away, remove from the tank, no issue at all. All right, so here's an example of how I cut off the uh, frag plug stem. I got these bone cutters. This is a medium sized one from uh, BLS and uh, expensive, but it worked well. So what I like to do is place the flat side against the, uh, the disc and slide the stem as, as in as, po as far in as possible. And then we're just gonna, and there it is. Nice clean cut of the flag plug stem. And now I can just glue this flat against rock. Right, I'll show you guys one more. Put the frag plug stem into the cutter and Peace. done deal. You get the idea. Hey, what's up, Reefers? I bet you don't even recognize me anymore. No more COVID hair. <laughs> it has been almost a week since the flasher wraps went in, and it has been about three days since I've mounted the Zoa frags. Let's take a look at how they're doing. I'm very happy to report that the flasher wraps has completely been accepted by the Reef Squad, and the male Lyotel Amphius is pretty much ignoring the uh, RAS completely, which is exactly what we want. And we do see the flash of RAS kind of hanging out and flashes fins once in a while, especially towards the yellow tank, because sometimes the yellow tank would kind of approach him and be like, hey, what up? Let's take a look at all these Zoas that I've mounted on rock. I'm gonna step back a little bit first so you can get a better look of the whole tank. You see that I actually made an effort to keep the sand bed clear of anything now. Before it was littered with all these frag plugs that just looked kind of messy. Uh, this time around, I move all the frag into the rock work as they should be. Most of them, I cut off the stem, super glue them directly onto a flat rock surface, and I think it looks great. Let's start from here. And I explain kind of like my aquascaping decisions. Basically, initially the problem was number one, there are a lot of frags all over the place, and number two, things that just kind of randomly toss in. There's no kind of like rhyme or reason. The way I try to do it in terms of placing zoas is to kind of put contrasting color together. So together, they enhance each other's coloration. Versus if I have all the red ones together, all the green ones together, they look kind of like all blend in and nothing really stands out. And as you can see, I tried to do like Rasta's Armor of God. Uh, I'm not sure what that is. And basically just you see like uh, yellow or green uh, and then right next to it, there'd be like a red or orange kind of deal. And the other thing I tried to do is that I tried to connect this little island right here with this arch. Before there's like a big gap in here so it doesn't look continuous and doesn't look as impressive. But I think that once I've connected uh, two big pieces of um, uh, structure, it really look much more congruent. I feel like it's gonna look fantastic, especially when the uh, soas all grow out. Here's the uh, one of the uh, eagle eyes that I uh, glued down and I actually placed it specifically next to the radioactive dragon eyes because in the past, about like 20 years ago when I was uh, first in a hobby, I remember seeing zoas coming in and these two morphs tend to be found together, at least on the uh, rocks that came in with zoas. So I thought maybe they're natural occurring um, in similar areas and I thought okay it's just natural to put them together it just looks right to me uh, moving up a little bit we move some of the uh, Rasta Zoas. I had a little rock right here. I move it up there to connect the two rock structures. I think that went well. And a little bit higher up on this rock structure, I got some of my more um, unique or like finer detail Zoas and Pallies that you really want to get close to take a good look at. Uh, that includes the other Chaos, the Angus of Athena's, and uh, Rainbow Infusion. But of course, we still got the uh, good old Eagle Eyes. I really like that coloration regardless of how common it is, as well as some of the Fruit Loop, uh, which, I've had like mixed success with them. They seem kind of touch and go. Same thing with the King Midas. It's like if I look at the King Midas wrong, 
they just all close up and really sh shrink in size. But if the condition is right, they come back nice, strong with big fat polyps. So I feel like I have them all in places that I like. So now it's just a matter of keeping the nutrients up and making sure they're happy. Recently, I read a thread that's kind of interesting. People asking the ideal alkalinity to keep zoas and pellies. And it seems like, at least from what I've read in that thread, that they do like higher DKA. I find it interesting because zoas is obviously soft corals. They don't have like skeleton structure like SPS does, but apparently they grow a lot better with a higher DKH. It's not just one person saying it, multiple people chimed in saying that that's what they have observed as well. So right now my tank is naturally sitting at 8.5. I've been kind of debating whether I want 8.5 or 9 and after reading that I think I'll slowly walk it up to 9. I feel like 8.5 and 9 is a happy medium uh, meaning that if my doser tube get clogged then I stop dosing calc or two parts it's not going to tank right away I still have a little buffer room and if something goes wrong I overdose uh, 8.5 or 9 I still got some buffer room on the upper range as well so I feel like that's a good number to be at and now that I read that Zoa may prefer a slightly higher DKH I think I was shoot for 9 DKH. By the way, oh, what's up? Another thing is your sun poop. Oh. One pair of pants later. All right, so the tank has been going really well for the last three weeks or so. One issue that I'm noticing is that I do have bubble algae coming back in. We're going full circle. There's like tiny little guys right here. Whenever I see them, I try to siphon them out, but it's like I always miss some of them. So this is starting to become an issue again. If you recall a couple months back, the whole reason I started dosing Vibrant is because I noticed bubble algae. Vibrant was able to knock out all the bubble algae after about two months, but the problem is that I did not keep my nutrient up, so dinoflagellant came in. I don't want to repeat the same thing again. I don't want to keep doing the same thing in cycles. So now I'm once again looking at biological control for bubble algae. I've tried ammo crabs. I still have maybe two or three really small female ammo crabs in here. I'm not sure if they're eating bubble algae. But the fact that I do see bubble algae on the sand bed now makes me a little bit worried because that means that we, I probably got some in the rock that I'm not seeing. So now I'm actually on a hunt to find fish store that will sell ammo crab that's guaranteed to eat bubble algae. Apparently there are some sites that do that online so I may look into that. But um, that is pretty much the only big issue I have with the 145 gallon at the moment. The other thing I started experimenting with this tank that's kind of interesting and uh, I'm not sure if I should share at the moment because I don't really have the result yet. It's running double daylight cycle, meaning that in a 24 hours period, I'm running five hours daylight, seven hours nights, and then five hours daylight, and then seven hours nights again. And if this one single week is any indication, the fish seems totally normal. The coral seems totally fine. Uh, I know in the past certain uh, coral breeder, they tried to do like double daylight cycle just like this in order to kind of like boost coral growth. But for me, my purpose is more like, okay, this way when I wake up, I can enjoy the tank in the morning and I can do work and whatnot. And at night afterwards, I can also enjoy the tank again. So once again, I just started this double daylight cycle experiments. I cannot really <laughs> give any honest feedback because I just started. And it's probably gonna take a couple of months before I can really say that it, it works or it does not work. So we'll see how it goes. But I'll keep a really close look at the health of the fish as well as the corals and how it impacts my water chemistry. And once again, this is when I'm really grateful for the Mastertronic because all the water parameters is at a glance. And so far I have not really noticed a big change. So keep checking back in this channel. If there's any change I notice, I'll be sure to let you know and if this double daylight cycle works, that would be fantastic. I think it's a game changer for me because now I can enjoy the tank so much more. Hey, look at this. It's feeding time for the fish. Look at that, eh? Awesome to see the yellow tang is like right out there competing with a lot of fish. It was really kind of shy before. These amphias actually eat flakes pellets, no problem at all. And same thing with the flasher rest. It's kind of hard to imagine. The flasher rest has been so shy uh, for the first like five days and then it just kind of broke out of a shell. Well, as soon as the male amphias decided is no longer a threat to all his ladies. Flash of rest, out and about. Earlier in this video, I talked about the stock list for this fish tank. I have some fish that are in quarantine right now that I I will be adding to this tank. If you've been following the channel, you know they are my dream showing fish and I have a couple of them. I'm trying to decide how many to put in this tank. Besides the show of fish, I also have the option to add one more fish that is kind of in the range of the size of a yellow tang or so. I feel like in terms of bio load, my tank should be able to handle it, but I'm more concerned about the territory for each fish. Right now, they're all really playing really nicely with each other, but with the addition of the other fish, uh, I might need to do some change. I may have to kind of work on the rock work 
to create more sleeping area for the different type of fish. So since right now the fish I have in mind are in quarantine at the fish store, I have about three weeks or so to really build up the rock structure here and back there to provide more space for the fish to kind of like divide and conquer. They all have their own area. But again, so far all these fish seems to be playing really well and I hope that dynamic does not change. All right, Leon, you've been talking a lot in the background. Is there certain things you want to say? Okay, okay, okay. Did you say? And uh, mom, you have been talking a lot in the yes. background as well. Do you have anything you want to say? No. She is like a creeper. Dude, she talking. is like a creeper. She's like holding her phone and recording me talking with my <laughs> son talking in the back. You two talking about fish. He keeps saying you, 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 you. He's pretending you. So he's learning from All right, here. <laughs> I'll put it back. Oh, 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 you know, so, oh, he put it back. Good job. Yeah. Oh, he's I just gave it. He's doing whatever he do. That's what daddy do, right? Oh, there you go. Alright, you grab the camera. I'm gonna give you the camera. Let's see what happens. Bye! <laughs> Apparently, cutting plants is about hormone control. Did you know that?